you've been following me at all the last, I guess, 10 years now, you know that I've been looking at early versions of .NET Core or .NET 5, whatever you want to call it, for quite a while. And yesterday they released .NET 8 Preview 3, and this introduces the first batch of some changes coming to C Sharp 12. I want to get you ready for them and kind of discuss what they're like. You're probably going to have strong opinions, and I want you to be prepared to send your feedback to Microsoft if you'll ever hate them but I'm gonna be showing you what they look like in Preview 3 and why they exist and how they're different. Let's get started. So I'm here in Visual Studio 2022 Preview. Preview is the only one that will likely work with .NET 8 right now. You can actually do this in code as well, but, but there is some IntelliSense that isn't working in the way that you might want it to inside of VS Code for these previews. So I'm gonna stick to Visual Studio. And I'm just gonna create a console app to show you some things. I wanted to show you creating the project because you here you can see the different versions that are installed on my particular machine. And if you wanna follow and play with this, you not only need Visual Studio 22 Preview, but you also need to install the .NET 8 SDK. The .NET 8 SDK does not come with the preview of Visual Studio. They're two separate downloads, but those should be pretty easy to install. So I'm gonna leave it at eight and just create a perhaps too simple example, but I'm gonna start because I like using a static here for system.console, so I could just do things like write line, hello from C Sharp 12, right? So none of what I'm showing you yet is in C Sharp. We're gonna really cover it in three main ways. And the biggest of the changes is something that's called primary constructors. So let's show you a primary constructor as it works before C Sharp 12. So we can have a public record, and let's call it people or person. And here at the end of the definition of the record, not inside the body of it, we can actually say first name, last name, right? And in fact, that can be the entire statement. So the idea behind this is if we were going to try to use it, is we could say new person, and it takes these as parameters. So this is the primary constructor for a record. And so I'll just give it my name, and then I can write line me dot last name, right? And so records have existed, and even class-based records or struct-based records exist in the way to have what are often thought of as data-only class declarations. So this by default is immutable as well, but the important idea here is that there's usually very little behavior associated with this. And so let's do this without the primary constructor. We could say public record person and create a constructor that passed in first name, last name, and just assign it both of these. And in this case, what is actually happening in here is these are init. This is what the boilerplate is when you use that primary constructor for records, right? This is really what it's doing as a primary way. And they're called primary constructors because you don't have to have just that constructor. You can create your own as well. But let's go ahead and comment out this one and we'll leave the idea of what this looks like because what's coming in C-sharp 11 is being able to do this to classes and structs. Now, unlike the person, we do need to have a class body, but this is going to allow us. But if we look at it, we can see that this feature primary constructors is in preview and unsupported, and that we are gonna have to opt into that preview. And so here I'm gonna say update this project to use the preview version. So even for using eight, right now they're just treating it as a preview version, right? So we've got this, so our person is constructed in the same way. But what we see here is there is no last name. And this is the big difference between primary constructors for records and for classes slash structs. The reason is this is not going to be constructed into a member here. But what is it actually doing? I'm not gonna actually lowercase these because all this is doing is having these parameters that are being passed into the primary constructor be available in the body. So if we wanna expose it, we're gonna have to write and expose it in that way. Of course, you could create these as properties with getters and setters as well, but... And so there we're getting something similar to what's happening here. It's sort of immutable, but it doesn't have to be. All we see here is when we call this last name, obviously this is a property of this person class. 
But what happens when we look at the first name? It's telling us in the IntelliSense here that it is a parameter. So these are injected in or are available anywhere. So if you didn't want to expose it, but you wanted to be able to create something like formatted return last name, first name, right? We don't want to give them access to the actual properties here. As long as these are referenced in the class, that's really all that matters. And of course, let's write line formatted instead. And so inside the formatted or any other code in here, if I said, look at the this pointer, what does it have in here? You'll notice it doesn't have first name or last name. We're seeing that these values are not a member of the type, even a private member of the type. And that's an important idea here, because what happens if we want to derive? We want to have a class derived from it. So let's create a manager. And ordinarily, we would say this derives from person and then write some code there, right? Manager doesn't succeed because it doesn't have a constructor here. Unless we created an empty constructor, we have to do something here. So let's go ahead and say string title, string first name, string last name, right? We have these pieces and on the person, we can just pass along first name, comma, last name, right? Title isn't being used yet. So we'll go ahead and say public title and just return the title. And so the ideas here that I think are important is that this isn't required in any sense, but there are going to be cases for small classes where this is gonna be easier than making it more verbose. And there's some argument about whether not having an actual constructor here is less clear. And I'm actually on the fence about this. I think this is perfectly clear. I have a class that has person that requires these types of information to be set. It doesn't mean that this just represents all the data that's associated with person. These are just the ones that I have to have. And I'm requiring that people that derive from my class also adhere to that requirement. Now you could always do this with constructors, but I think this makes some development easier when we think about it in this way. If you have strong opinions about primary constructors, which I know a lot of people do, make sure and visit the discussion about it. I'll have it pinned in the first message in the comments below the like button. So let's ignore these for a minute. I'm gonna leave this in here because I'll go ahead and check all this in later in case you wanna just get at this code, which I can't imagine why you actually would, but let's talk about something different. The next thing I wanna talk about are aliases. Now, Aliases have been around for a while, but they're making it available to all sorts of different types. It just isn't for some smaller use cases. So let's talk about a problem and then I'll talk to you about how aliasing can help that. So let's say I'm gonna create a call that just says output info, right? And I might want two pieces of information here, like string name and string description. Name description and make this right line. Doesn't really matter which way you do it. And this is fine, but maybe what you want here is actually something different. What happens if you want to use something like a tuple? So I have two strings here, and I'm just gonna call this the info. If you haven't used tuples before, this is just a sort of a temporary sort of object that has the different types. And then what this becomes is info.item1 and info item two. And no one likes this format, right? So let's say output info, and then we could pass in a tuple saying Sean recorded video, right? And then we can say output info, and we can just pass that right in. And this would work, right? But this code's kind of ugly. So, you know, maybe that first version where you're using individual parameters makes sense, but often having this as sort of a packet of information would be useful. So in fact, you can define these with names. So let's go back to name and description, right? This tuple declaration means that we can now use name and description, and that we could certainly take this same declaration here and define that data type there. Obviously var makes it easier, but we can see that in a system where you're gonna be using this, you might have this defined a number of times. Now, tuples are great in a bunch of different cases, but I use them often for these small packets of data that I'm gonna be using locally instead of having to go and create an entire class every time, even if it's a very simple class or even record. What aliasing allows us to do is really define an alias at a file level. I think it also works in global, but that would just be a mess. So we'll use it at the file level. And let's say I'm gonna say using info equals that type, right? 
And so we now have a alias down here that we can just replace for small pieces that we want to be able to do. So this code becomes more readable even though we're not defining a new data type that's internal or private or whatever it needs to be. It's just saying, you know, in this class, I need this weird little thing and I need it once and I want to define it and not have to go through the trouble of creating a nested class or another file class or whatever it is and populating it with more and more things just because I need a little packet of information here. I need the requirement for what we're passing in. And so aliasing allows you to do that. You know, you could kind of oddly say my string equals string as well. These are types that you're defining here. Avoid this, like don't go renaming every object that you're gonna need. Make it when you're going to try to make the code clearer and simpler, just biting off that I'm trying to make a named object that will make my code clearer, that if I'm going to output info, I probably need an info in here. And when we look at the info, it'll define what it actually looks like and IntelliSense continues to work, right? And so this is just another tool in the quiver. Overusing it is gonna be a nightmare. Not using it all is fine, but in cases where you need it, this is actually a pretty good way to handle it a, on a small scale basis. And the final thing we'll talk about real quick is lambdas with default values. So this feature probably affects a number of places. The biggest one that affects me personally is in minimal APIs because default values weren't allowed where we're defining them as lambdas. But let's ignore that for a minute. Let's just do something much simpler. I'll make something called write, and I'm gonna use a lambda to say message, and I'm gonna say write line message. And this can't infer it in this particular case, so we'd probably put something like string here to define it. Right, we have uh, our parameters going in and we have a way to write out the line, all that's good. But what if I wanted to be able to call write like that? So let's write hello. And then down here, this write doesn't work because of course this is an action with a single parameter. And while we could use functions and methods before, we've never had the ability to do this directly in lambdas. And so, being able to default parameters of a Lambda is the new feature in c -sharp 12. Will probably only affect a small number of things, but it will make writing minimal APIs in ASP.NET a lot easier. So those are the three features that are available now in Preview 3 of .NET 8. Go ahead and look at them if you want to play around with them. They're probably going to change over time or really pretty far from the actual release, but I want you to see what's sort of coming and you'll be able to feed back changes to Microsoft if you just really hate what they're doing there and, and so you can have that conversation. If you've gotten this far, please feel free to like and subscribe. That really helps me. And I'll see you next time on Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth.